Uh, welcome to this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, it's going to be on feed based prophylactics for tackling vibrios in shrimp. Um, I'm Rob Fletcher. I am senior editor of the fish site, I'm bringing you this webinar uh, in conjunction with uh, Callista, who you'll find out more about later. Um, we have a great panel line, lineup of panelists here. We have Locke Tran, we have Dr. Oripin uh, Jasataporn, uh, we have Alan LeBlanc, and we also have Yit Tung. Um, you'll find that you, many, you'll know many of them already, um, but uh, you'll find out more about them as the event goes on. Uh, but we're going to kick off with a short presentation um, uh, about some, some very, what we think are very exciting results uh, about some new research into uh, feed kind protein. Um, AJ, can you take it away, please? Good day, everybody. I'm Dr. Olapin Jinta Sathapon, Associate Professor in Aquaculture at Gasset University in Thailand. Today, I would like to talk about a study that I recently done on the substitution of fish meal for feed kai, which is a microbial protein in the diet of shrimp. Last week, we published the result of the study in Fontria in marine side. The results show that feed kai cannot only be used as an alternative protein for fish meal, but also can help to protect chim against early mortality syndrome, which is one of the greatest health challenges facing shrimp in Southeast Asia. This study was divided into two parts. The first part we study on the growth performance. During six weeks study, we test the performance of shrimp fed the diet containing 15% fish meal. The performance of shrimp fed diet in which one third, two third, or 100% of fish meal has been replaced with feed kai protein. The results show that growth performance in terms of final weight, weight gain, average daily gain, specific growth rate, feed consumption, feed conversion ratio, and survival rate of shrimp was very really similar across all of these four treatments. This result suggests that the feed kai could potentially be used as a replacement for fish meal if it is can produce in sufficient quantity. For the second try, the second try we study on the challenge test by bar treatment with BBO Parahemolyticus the causative agent of EMS, and the study held for further 15 days to access the survival rate and the resistance. The results suggest that the replacement of at least two-thirds of the fish meal with feed kai significantly promote the survival rate and lead to the reduction of BBO in hepatopancreas of the white shrimp. So, it is important to test the use of feed kai beyond the lab setting to see whether the results are comparable in a commercial shrimp farm where the environmental parameter is different. If the results are similar, diet containing feed kai may have long-term potential to reduce the use of antibiotic and fish meal in the shrimp sector. So, for the further study, I look forward to discuss the results of the Kai study as well as other non-medicinal agents to improve shrimp health with other shrimp experts in this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Oripin. Um, that's uh, yes, I don't know if I invite everyone to have a look at that study in more detail. It's in Frontiers of Marine Science, it's open access, um, and it's uh, I, I think the results are very compelling. Admittedly, they're in a laboratory, not in the field, um, but uh, it's yeah, I think there's definitely some, some grounds for optimism there, um, on a number of fronts, as um, as as Alan LeBlanc, 
um, who is uh, Senior Vice President of, uh, of Callista, um, will explain in more detail. Um, Alan, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks to you, Dr. Oropent, Dr. Tran, and uh, Yit for, for joining us today. Um, I have a very few number of slides that I was going to share on, on Callista and Feedkind and, and kind of where we are. Um, but I'm going to let the research kind of stand for itself and not, uh, not really dig into that. I think it's, it's best saved for later when we can have the discussion in the Q&A. Um, so with that said, I'm going to hopefully slides that everyone can see. Um, so I just wanted to kind of quickly introduce for people that weren't familiar with Callista, or weren't familiar with Feedkind or, or who we are and what we do, um, a little bit about the company, the product, um, et cetera. So Callista is a biotech company uh, that's been around for almost 10 years. Um, I've been with the company for more than eight. And um, for seven of those years, we've been focused on commercializing Feedkind, a, a protein for aquaculture. Uh, we originally started very much focused on um, Northern Europe, where the product has uh, originally developed and people were familiar with it, but, but quickly realized that, that shrimp in Asia was the opportunity for us and the place we really wanted to spend our time. Um, more recently, we've partnered with Adicio. They're a large uh, French company owned by Blue Star that is a, produces methionine, so the crystalline amino acid that you know, is used throughout the feed industry. Um, and with them, we're building a plant in Chongqing, China, which will be built uh, next year, will be completed next year, I should say. Um, and the last thing that I'll, I'll mention just about the corporate, uh, our, our, as a corporation, is we partnered with BP. So, so we do a gas-based fermentation. And so British Petroleum, or BP, is, uh, is an investor in us and a partner um, helping us have access to those resources. So this is the product. Uh, Feedkind is a, is a fine powder. It's slightly pink in person, although it looks a little more brownish here. Um, it is the biomass from the bacteria that we fermented. So it's, it's kind of analogous to a yeast extract. And, and that's really why, you know, we believe we're having these really positive effects on the shrimp's immune response. Um, as a, as a bacteria, we have uh, lipopolysaccharides and cell wall components, and those have all been proven to stimulate the innate immune, immune response, help prepare shrimp or fish to resist the challenge. Um, and, and this is really kind of the culmination of several years of, of exploring this and finally getting um, really what I think is smoking gun and evidence that, that we can uh, make a big difference here. So this is how we do it. Uh, this is our uh, uh, diagram of the production process. It's actually quite simple. Um, the first step is a fermentation. There's uh, a bunch of gases and microbes in there. It's kind of the uh, proprietary secret sauce of the company. But after that, it's standard um, processes. So centrifuge, dry package. Uh, and that's, that's the dry powder that you see coming out in the prior slide. So what does that mean um, for scale and for the industry? And, and that's something that I think uh, Callista and Feedkind generally sees as, a, as how we set ourselves apart against a lot of the alternatives is that we're here to deliver scale. And so this is a, a picture of our plant being built in, um, in Chongqing. Uh, this was as of maybe four to six weeks ago. Um, you can see the pipe that they're uh, lowering. That is the fermenter um, where all of the kind of magic happens. And that loop fermenter is 300,000 liters um, in total. And there are two of them. So this is after they've been installed, they're put in place. Uh, there's still lots of wiring and plumbing and things to be finished. Uh, this won't be commissioned until next year, but I, I think it gives you an idea of the scale of the investment and, and the scale of the project um, and how excited we are for bringing this product to market uh, in aquaculture for shrimp, but generally aquaculture across all sorts of species, because we really believe a, a lot of these um, immune response effects that we're finding in shrimp will translate to fin fish as well. And, and we kind of have ongoing research um, in that area. So I will stop there and let uh, Rob kind of take it over and, and get back to um, what I hope is an interesting discussion for everyone. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's sort of good hard evidence that you are, you know, this is not something that's just happening in a in a tiny lab somewhere. It's something that's going to get scaled up pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, I just wondered what sort of uh, uh, what sort of feedback have you had from the industry to date? Um, 
obviously I, I'd imagine people are, you know, keen to get a hold of this product. Um, how are you going yeah, to ensure I mean, they can? Yeah, it's it's um, it's something that we've we've had a lot of very positive uh, trials with feed companies. So most of the major feed companies in in the region have uh, had samples of varying sizes. Uh, the biggest project we've done to date was with um, Thai Union Feed Mill in Thailand, where we produced, you know, uh, I think 15 or 20 tons of shrimp and, and sold them at the Brussels Seafood Show and, and showed that there was no changes in taste or color or growth. Um, effectively, it was the exact same product as if you'd used uh, a marine-based feed. And those were, you know, those were fish meal free um, feeds. So. Uh, we're we're working throughout the region. I think you know the the building the factory has been the gating item, and and that's kind of we're finally there, which is one of the reasons we're so excited to be talking to people in um, webinar today because it is only nine months away, um, and we will be commercial in the market very soon. Fantastic. Well, that's uh, exciting news, Alan. And and obviously, there's two elements to the research. Um, going back to um, Dr. Oropin's research. Um, that there's the potential for it to replace fish meal um, and there's also potential for it to help prevent um, uh, EMS uh, amongst other things. H how, how do you plan to position it? Do you plan to position it as a fish meal replacement, as a, as a, um, as a functional feed ingredient? Um, what, 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 how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I think you really, you nailed it when you said functional feed ingredient. I, I think there's um, there's a lot of additives in the marketplace today, and there's a lot of um, ingredients in the marketplace today. And I think one of the things that we've really been able to um, to bring is both a protein ingredient that has the functional benefits of an additive. So you can kind of get you can get two for one in that sense. Um, it's not just a, a cost add like you would see um, for a lot of additives, where you know your your formulation cost goes up. Uh, and you're solely betting on that benefit. We can see equivalent formulation um, costs because the protein brings nutritional value, and then we can see those functional additive benefits as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm going to address the next question to you. Um, uh, would you like to tell the audience a, li a little bit about yourself first, please? So my name is Yit. I'm the CEO of Rasa Culture. At Rasa Culture, we do mainly shrimp farming and crab farming. But for shrimp, we utilize Bioflock uh, and we have an indoor Bioflock facility that's a hundred km away from the coast. Thank you, Yit. Um, and so from a farmer's perspective, um, what does, what's the significance of this, uh, this new research and, and the possible av availability of feed kind to you? All right, so, um, you know, I've looked at extensively at uh, feed kind's product and the combination of being able to do a fish meal replacement and a supplement really, you know, has two folds of benefits, right? So, you know, traditional how farms tends to work in Asia or where might at least in Malaysia, you know, farmers don't really want to invest in anything that will, you know, like functional feeds, although it might save them down, down the line if they have an EMS breakout, right? But if you, if you were to tell the farmers that we have a product or feed kind of has a product, that could be embedded, you know, to the feed meals and it could protect it down. It will be more logical for them to, to adopt, provided there's a price parity for the view, right? So for me, what's great about this product is um, you get both fish meal replacement and that sort of supplement that could be already applied in way advanced before they have any problems. And I believe, you know, if you look at Dr. Arpin's paper, you, you tend to have uh, feed try formulation for 15 days followed by the challenge test, right? You know, most of the feed formulation products out there can't really save you if they're already challenged, right? If it's done, applied before, then it's stand a chance. If it's occurring on the fly, you know, really hard for any products out there to, to save, you know, your shrimp as a, as a whole crop, yeah. So, so if, you were, if you were to um, think that there was a, danger of an EMS outbreak, what, how, would you, how would you react to that? And what, you know, would, I, what would be the telltale signs as well? So obviously, you know, we, we do monitor a lot of vibro, uh, vibro breakouts in our farm. But if you talk to the average farmers in Malaysia, and if they're fine, they have a vibro breakout or they have an EMS breakout, what they'll tell you is harvest your shrimp and take a two-month holiday to dry your ponds. <laughs> That's what they will do. If, uh, if it's happening on your farm, um, then that's, that's an approach that they would take. If it's happening outside of your farm, uh, that means to farms that are 
in your neighboring section. You know, we don't go around trying to point fingers to who is responsible for the EMS outbreak. But what we tend to do on the next side is we'll try to reduce water exchange, you know, tighten up biosecurity. You know, we don't want to be taking in, you know, EMS from other farms as well. So that's really more of a, uh, you know, prevention is always better than cure, but that's, you know, the ways that, you know, how are we sort of mitigating or how are we coping with these EMS issues uh, over in Malaysia? So, so is that a time if there was neighboring, an outbreak in a neighboring farm, would you really consider um, ramping up the, 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 the feeds you're using as well and, and, and possibly not nope. at that stage? No, okay. yeah. So, yeah, because, you know, traditional farms that do not have um, what we call uh, filtration systems or they're not using any sort of bioflock, they will have to rely on water change to sort of maintain their water quality, right? And, you know, trying to overfeed or feeding as per normal level will sort of deteriorate that water quality even faster. And if you don't have that option to perform water change, that means your shrimps will only die of ammonia poisoning or they'll die of EMS. So, yeah, you choose which one is it, uh, okay. you know, yeah. And, 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 and some of your farms are, are, are recirculation systems, is that right? Uh, yep, we have done clear water systems and uh, we have done uh, biosock systems. But I think uh, in terms of a very scale up production and in terms of mass market adoption, I think biosock would be a better option as compared to a uh, clear water RAS system, at least in Asia. Okay. And, and is EMS as much of a problem in, in those systems as it is in, in open systems? <laughs> right now, uh, in Malaysia, I think everybody that has done shrimp farming have had it at least once, okay. right? Uh, yeah, and it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Sometimes in Malaysia, if I check with seed meals, you know, they will say, given the same state, you know, some areas are having this EMS issue while others are okay. Then we see EMS migrating another region while this, the other regions previously affected is getting better. And we, we, you know, we see that for very occasionally from time to time as well. Okay. So it's, it's something that's constantly on your radar and, and any, any sort of new tool in the box is, is, is good news as far as you're concerned. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Um, Dr. Locke, um, uh, you have a quite a sort of a close relationship with, uh, with, with, with Vibrio, shall we say. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that before you, uh, uh, before I ask the next question? <laughs> okay, so it's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this webinar. So I'm Lok Tran, I'm uh, CEO of uh, Minpu Afro Company, or the nickname is Srimvet. So we're doing a bit of uh, everything, including diagnostic, uh, research and development, uh, hatchery management, and shrimp farm management. Yeah, so we've been dealing with uh, VBOs, and, and that's very much of my entire career. Because <laughs> you, um, you, you made one of the key research breakthroughs into, into the link between Vibrio and, and EMS, didn't you? Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, sorry, you made one of the key research breakthroughs when it came to finding the link between uh, Vibrio and, and EMS. Yes, and the Dr. Don Leitner. Well, it's a good, good to have someone of your pedigree on board. Um, uh, yes, and from a shrimp health perspective, um, how do you see the significance of this uh, new research into, uh, into feed kind? Yeah, so, you know, basically, uh, I would say that with the intensification of shrimp farming, uh, shrimp become more prone to vibrio infection. And, you know, that is due to the uh, eutrophication of the water system, pollution, et cetera, and so on, and the emergence of uh, um, um, infectious uh, pathogenic vibrios. Uh, so um, I would say that in the past, when we first deal with an emerging disease coming from, let's say, vibrios, we try to do the exclusion methods. We're trying to screen for any source of uh, contamination, biosecurity implementation, and so on. And then we quickly realized that we just can't, <laughs> we just can't exclude everything because Vibrio is so ubiquitous in the environment. And we need to learn how to coexist with the bacteria and how to do it. And you know, that must be done uh, with a holistic approach, including biosecurity. Yeah, for sure, we still need to have better uh, post-larvae, uh, a better environment through uh, 
a better water treatment system, better pond engineer and water treatment system, probiotics, and so on. And third, we need to put some functionality in the feed in order to make the feed more suitable for the shrimp, making less pollution, and also bringing some added values, I call it some added values in terms of um, um, immunity uh, modulation and in terms of uh, bringing some uh, prophylactics uh, compound in order to um, suppress uh, uh, the vibrios. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that um, our laboratory has been involved in those similar research uh, for a while. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of uh, good stuff have been tested and proven. But when it comes to implementation at the feed mill, sometimes we have uh, some hesitant from uh, the feed mill because, you know, we understand that uh, cost is pretty sensitive uh, to feed mill. So when it comes to uh, using a new ingredients, it may create some cost increase. And secondary, uh, the traditional uh, belief is that um, the feed mill are selling nutrition. They are not selling uh, treatment. They're not selling a cure for the disease and so on. But uh, I think quickly we understand that, uh, we understood that the feed mill is a very important part of the entire production chain and they need to help farmers in order to increase the success rate at the farms, in order to have more clients, in order to stay ahead of the competition and so on. So that is why I, I saw many, many feed mill are more engaged in uh, this kind of uh, innovative uh, research. And uh, I think feed Kai is, is a very interesting one. Uh, we were very uh, uh, pleased to test the products uh, at our laboratory with very good results. And I think when it comes to a new products, you know, first we have some problem with regards to the cost, but I think with the uh, uh, economies of scale. I mean, uh, sooner or later, we have uh, more cost effectiveness. And, you know, uh, when I, I, I try to compare the innovative uh, ingredients versus the traditional ingredients, I feel like it is like uh, electric uh, car versus the combustion engine car. You know, you see first, the, the, the electric car could be expensive, could be fancy, but you know, when we have more and more people engaged in new technology, it will bring uh, the cost now and we'll, it will create a better world for everyone. Thank you, Locke. And uh, Alan, is that something you can talk about the cost of, uh, of feed kind and how you see that um, trajectory going? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a question we get a lot, um, obviously. I mean, it's a, it's a margins are slim in feed and it's a cost sensitive industry. Um, and, and one that we're, we're sensitive to, I mean, I, so we have a, we have a nutritionist on staff, um, a feed formulator, Jaren Suwan Banchun. Um, she is, she's based in Thailand and the work that, that she's done and, and that I've done with her is we're very confident that feed companies can take an existing, um, feed or feed line, incorporate feed kind into it and deliver the same nutritional value at the same cost with improved performance. Um, and, and that comes from a couple of things. I mean, one, it's, it's, it's to some extent, you know, our pricing, we're at a premium. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, you know, avoid that question. We are at a pricing and a premium to fish meal, but when you look at the nutrient density, the amino acid profile and the performance in, in pelleting or um, extruding the feeds, all those functional benefits add up. And they give you a little bit more flexibility in blending in some other protein ingredients, um, more flexibility in using plant proteins or adjusting your starch levels, and um, you know higher value uh, or higher nutrient values um, from the outset. So you can do things like less supplementation with methionine or tryptophan or amino acids. And so um, you know what we've tried to do is provide a solution to the feed companies that lets them deliver value to the farmer without asking them to, uh, to pay more. Okay, I think that's, that, that's good news. Um, <clears throat> how do you see that from a, from a farmer's perspective yet? Yeah, because you know how feed kind is really different from out, out there, the other products is, uh, you know, you guys have a much higher infusion rate. You know, typically, you know, your feed supplements will 
to, to fight against Vibro would be in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.5, right? So this allows a lot of farmers to sort of, um, you know, buy these additives and, you know, add it all as a top dressing onto their feed manually, right? So from a management point of view, you know, that's what managers think that is actually happening in a farm, but whether is it, does it actually really happen? Do your operators go down and actually mix in, take time and mix it in the feed or the feed additive is a separate different question, right? But for feed kind case, you know, uh, with a five to 15% formulation, no farmer, right? Uh, you know, for example, if you have an acre of pond, you use up to 15, 15 tons of feed. A 5% formulation is going to be a few hundred kilograms, right? You can't, you can't be buying those off a uh, feed kind and storing them somewhere in your farm and to mix it manually. So I see it being, you know, just like what Locke said earlier, the feed meals has an integral part to play in this process, not just in terms of just blending the feed, but also in terms of logistics, getting the product down into the local market cheaply in bulk, right? That's one. And also using volume to sort of, uh, you know, because feed... I'm sure feed kind has also a shelf life, right? If I'm, I'm a farmer buying a ton of feed kind, trying to mix my own feed, you know, probably within three months or six months, I, I still have tons of feed kind lying around my farm. But if I work with a feed meal, you know, that would be very different in terms of our logistics and inventory. So that's a really what's different about what I see feed kind product is versus out the products out there in the market. And, you know, feed meals, uh, how is it different in Asia versus different in... Uh, for example, Norway or the salmon industry in Europe is farmers in Asia typically are smallholders, right? So guys with two to three acres of pond. Um, in more, more than often, it is very difficult for a farmer to, to do anything if the feed cost increases, right? So, you know, but from a feed, feed news point of view, if you could provide a product that could not only save us and protect us, I, I see... I see that being really, really important to sort of, uh, you know, sustaining the whole industry as a whole. And from a feed news point of view, if their customers, which is us farmers, do succeed in culture, then, you know, their cost of acquisition, you know, they don't have to spend so much on acquiring new customers because most of their customers are producing well and, you know, sustaining their own business. Thank you, yep. Yeah. Alan, I hope you're learning from this. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm very much listening. And I, I think, um, you know, he's confirming a lot of things that, 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 uh, you know, we believed, which is um, selling through the feed mill and not having it be something the farmer has to um, top dress is, is a benefit. Yes. Uh, and having the, and having the product in the feed and blended consistently is a benefit because you just can't get the same mixing and the same value um, to the entire pond when you're, you know, sprinkling a little bit on the top. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, um, so when you're de dealing with feed meal, right? So if you ask your average farmer, right, uh, you know, do you know what they actually put inside the feed? The answer is no, right? The farmer only reads two things. Number one is the price. Second is the protein levels, right? You know, how feed meal operate is tend to, they tend to switch out the raw material based on commodity prices. And, you know, being all things being equal, if, you know, feed kind can be one of those options to shelter or protect the feed meal against high feed meal, high fish meal costs while protecting our farmers, I think it's a win-win for us, right? Um, I don't think it's a, of course, some farmers would have the clout to influence the feed meal, but I think uh, working with the feed meal directly would, would be a much better option in terms of logistic pricing and, you know, at the end of the day, build, building up that value in the farmer down the line. Brilliant. Um, one thing we haven't touched on here is sustainability. I mean, obviously, there's issues with fish mill sustainability. Um, and uh, there's issues of sustainability in terms of um, uh, the use of antibi antibiotics, which is an alternative to, to, to using functional feeds. Um, uh, would anyone like to talk about that? Alan, have you, is that something you're going to be... Um, to marketing was that something you've had some some feedback from uh, from uh, consumers for example yeah i mean there's a there's a great sustainability story to tell um around a lot of these alternatives you know when you can take out the the problematic fish meal and again i i'm not um and and we're not advocating that all fish meal must be removed from feeds but if you can take out the non-certified the of questionable origin um part of it you know you you 
really kind of future proof and improve the sustainability and the ESG profile of the whole industry. And that's valuable for shrimp buyers, right? That's valuable for your European supermarkets. It's valuable for your North American supermarkets. And it's valuable to individual countries like, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia. Um, so there's a sustainability story to tell, but, but I also recognize that, that it's hard for both feed mills and, and farmers to get paid for that. So that's not something that we um, are, you know, that's not our, we're not leading with that. We think it's great. We think it's, um, it's important. We think that long-term the supply chain will pull the whole industry towards it. But um, when we go visit feed mills, we're very much focused on um, health performance and nutritional performance. Thanks, Alan. And yeah, for you, is that is that something you're looking into um, to try and get premium prices for your shrimp? Uh, hopefully I can, but you know how it works nowadays is um, in terms of the global frozen market, I think it's a bit hard for countries like Malaysia or Thailand to compete against Vietnam or Indonesia or Ecuador. So if you look at a lot of what are the local producers are doing, they're actually going domestic, right? So meaning selling our shrimp instead of trying to export them, we sell them locally. Um, so when it comes to local domestic uh, consumption, of course, you people look at freshness. And I'm, you know, I'm lucky that, you know, Alan, you actually provided a very important point, which is the shrimp does not taste differently after, even though at a 15% replacement, right? Mm. I'm sure to, you know, everybody tends to forget uh, aquaculture at the end of the day is a food product and in Asia taste is pretty important right so you know we, we, we have people that come to tell me you know I, I don't eat tilapia farm tilapia because that tastes muddy right there's this muddy taste which is mainly from some bacteria inside the pond right so I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you know feed kind has really looked at this you guys have verified that you know using at 100% fish meal replacement you don't have this issue and I'm sure that you know it's something that to lead on up you know, consumers here are willing to pay for freshness, taste, uh, sustainability. As unfortunately, in Asia alone, I think we still have a bit of uh, picking up to do in you know compared to European markets as well. Okay, thank you. Good honest answer. Um, Locke, in terms of uh, you know uh, the sustainability of, of of using something like feed kind uh, as opposed to using antibiotics, um, can you can you talk about that a little bit, please? Did, did you catch that question, Locke? Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear you again, please, sir. No, I just just still on the question of sustainability. Um, in the long term, obviously, using antibiotics to treat EMS is is is, is not seen as sustainable. Um, so so, what do you think of uh, yes, the sustainability story of feed kind uh, as opposed to antibiotics or alternative treatments? Yeah. You know, I don't want to criticize antibiotic, but uh, so far as I work in uh, Vietnam dealing with farmers, I could see that um, bacteria develop uh, resistant to, antib uh, to antibiotics very quickly. <laughs> so it's a very short term solution by using antibiotics. And you see there's a lot of regulation in terms of um, controlling the antibiotic residuals. And I also working with a uh, processor and exporter so we uh, really need to have a, a better solution. And that is why uh, cyan comes. And I would say that uh, the functionality coming from the ingredients, the prophylactics, et cetera, uh, is a very good way of uh, controlling the bacteria. And I would say that uh, it will not be like 100% killing the bacteria. We don't need to do so because we, we, we can learn how to coexist with the, the bacteria, but more importantly, with all those science embedded in the feed and in the farming technology, we can make the crop a lot more predictable, a lot more consistent. And I would say that uh, consistency and predictability is are the, two, uh, the two keywords when we scale up any businesses. And I see a lot of corporate farms uh, integrated with uh, processing plan and exporting, et cetera. Uh, they, they, they face some challenges when they scale up their production. And I would say that all the technology that we embedded in the feed make their business a lot more consistent and a lot more predictable. Okay. Thank you, Locke. 
Um, Dr. Oropind. Hello. Sawadika. Uh, Sawadika. You're... Um, uh, having done having done this trial with uh, uh, with Feedkind, are, are there other uh, products or other trials coming through in Thailand um, that you're working with uh, as alternatives to um, antibiotics in, in for treating uh, EMS? Okay, uh, so for the trial that we conduct during this time, I think many material or many feed additive that we use to prevent uh, the EMS. So in this case, we can we can use some raw material, especially for the group of single protein like yeast or the bacteria like feed kai. Yeah, because of this group of uh, raw material, they can provide both of the nutrient and also the some active ingredient that can stimulate the immunity. Yeah. Uh, Are there a lot of different uh products that you're trialing at, at, at your university? Another trial that we, we conduct in the university. Are, are, you, are you trialing a lot of different um, products at uh, the yes. university? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so for, for the focus at university, we conduct, we, we can separate the group of raw material, like uh, the protein replacement for fish meal, the canola protein, concentrated protein, or the plant concentrated protein like the gluten, uh, pea protein, pea concentrated protein, yeah. And also we do some try on the fermented soybean meal, yeah. So in, in this case, we focus on the protein replacement for fish meal because of uh, most of the high protein material, they put the contain the amino acid and including another another uh, specific uh, material yeah that's suitable for the drink and can replace the fish meal and also uh, another group that also contain the protein not too high but it have the specific uh, sim immune stimulant material inside including the group of additive directly stimulate the I mean uh, the immune or shrimp like the herb extract. Yeah, we do a lot on, on this group. But for the for replacement of fish meal, the important thing that uh, we need to focus, firstly, amino acid. Because of the fish meal, it contains high amino acid content, especially for the essential amino acid, like the lysine, methionine, arginine, tryptophan. Yeah, yeah. This group of amino acid also provide in the feed kai, but another another specific ingredient or additive that the plant material or the the animal protein byproduct like protein meal or pork meal or meat and bone meal they contain really little is the group of immune stimulant. So for the immune stimulant, we can find in in uh, the microorganism like the yeast or the bacteria. Because of this group of microorganism, during we culture it or we harvest it, yeah, it will produce a lot of uh, immune stimulant. Yeah. Some some we call it like metabolite of microorganism, yeah. That they produce is during we culture it and harvest it. And some is the component of the cell, like the yeast cell wall or the bacterial cell wall. Yeah, this uh, material can stimulate the immune. Okay. So I think I think uh, we can use uh, the group of microorganism uh, to replace the fish meal because of it's the what is it the future of the raw material because micro microorganism like yeast bacteria or even the plankton we can harvest and can culture it a lot from nature or or uh, culture it by fermentation techniques. Yeah. And we can balance the cost in the future. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. No, that's it. That's that's good to know that there's um yeah that, that that's how the science behind it. Um, and it's good to know there's a whole range of these. Well, Alan might not be pleased, but it's good to know there's a whole range of these uh, <laughs> of these organisms that may have uh, beneficial properties. So, I think that's exciting for the industry. Um, how do you feel about that, Alan? The, the, 
is it becoming a crowded field? Well, I mean, one, I, I agree that most single cell proteins will have some immune effect, right? I mean, we're all kind of operating in the same um, pathways. And, and, and so we're, we have trials planned um, in the coming year to try to prove out the exact mechanism. But, but our current view is that the, the cell walls are um, stimulating an immune response and elevating the antimicrobial peptides that are the innate response to the shrimp. So it's effectively preparing for a pathogen and then degrading those bacteria when they, um, when they enter the animal. So different products will have different single cell proteins and different uh, products, whether it's yeast or bacteria, will have um, different effects. I think the, the thing that we were excited about is, is um, being able to quantify it in a very measurable way to where we not just saw, we didn't just see survival changes, we also saw it in um, different uh, plating counts when, when they plated the hepatopancreases. And then we have a separate trial that was done at Guangdong Ocean in China that found a very similar effect with uh, um, IP injection. And so we've now got a, uh, like a collective uh, body of evidence that's very supportive for this particular application instead of a generic, yes, we turn on the immune system, which, which you know, in my view is, is interesting, but not quite like good enough to, to bring to the industry. Okay, thank you. That's, it's, that's very much. Um, just, just looking at the questions from the audience now, um, a, a lot of them are curious about the mechanism. So I think uh, Dr. Oropint and Alan, I think you've, you, you've answered that um, broadly. Um, but just looking at some other questions here, um, Alan, this one's for you. Uh, what other species are you testing? Uh, have, you, have you trialed um, feed kinds with? Sure. So um, within, within China, we've done largemouth bass. Um, we've tested it in uh, black sea bream. We've tested it in uh, channel catfish, um, long nose catfish. I mean, a whole variety of kind of specialty fin fish, snakehead, that are, that are focused primarily in China, but also kind of throughout, throughout Southeast Asia. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in, in, again, traveling a bit, but rainbow trout and salmon um, in kind of our traditional uh, stomping grounds in Northern Europe and Mediterranean species. So, so we're, we're very confident that uh, this product and, and kind of um, feed kind works in any application in aquaculture. Now the, the levels that it's best suited for vary across species. So some, some marine fish might only um, you know, do best at 10% because they, they are sensitive to flavor or pellet texture. Whereas shrimp, I mean, you can go fish meal free, you can go high as 15% or higher. Um, so, so we've done a lot of work to try and uh, be able to guide feed companies towards what's the optimal outcome depending on the application they're interested in. Okay. Thank you. I'm afraid you're the, quite a few of these questions are for you, Alan. So you might have to bear with me. <laughs> um, uh, there's one here. Lots of small scale farmers might be reluctant to try new products uh, due to lack of resources. Have you thought about subsidizing small scale farmers to adopt the use, use of feed kind? Yeah, I mean, we, we have it in the sense that um, it's, it's hard for us as a feed, in, feed ingredient company to like uh, partner with farmers directly. I mean, we, we really need the feed mill to, to be um, that intermediary. And, and what we've tried to do is, is one, find uh, thought leaders on the feed side and also farmers that are, you know, kind of large, integrated, focused on export markets that can trial it in, you know, a, a quarter of their footprint. Um, and, and what I'm hopeful is that, that that data will then allow the smaller farmers who are more risk averse and, you know, have, have fewer ponds and they can't afford to put them all on a new feed or all off, um, that that'll give them the confidence to move forward uh, so that it won't have to be each farmer trialing each feed. Eventually, they'll be available everywhere and they'll be confident that it'll work. And, and, and following on from that, um... Another question from the audience. So, when are you planning to, to do the trials on a larger scale uh, in the field? Yeah, so I think we'll have some more pond scale data um, kind of in the next three to six months. But, but really, you know, we're commissioning our 20,000 ton per year plant in Q4 of next year. 
So starting in uh, in September, and so that's when we'll be shipping, um, you know, hundreds of tons to individual feed companies, and and at that point it's going to be ubiquitous. Uh, and so what we'll be doing is trying to work with, with them to be able to monitor large scale impacts and see, okay, if, if these 10 farms got feed kind product and these 10 farms didn't, can we, can we measure that Delta in survival or that Delta in outbreak frequency? Um, but, but I, I think as, as everyone knows, the, the bigger your ambitions get, the harder it is to measure things. And so it's, it's, at some, uh, at some level, you have to do things on smaller scales to, to, really see differences. Okay. And and this is for you or, or, or potentially for Dr. Oripint. Um, Yet may have some thoughts on it as well, but um, have you trialed it in a, in a recirculation system? And, and are there any impacts there on the, uh, uh, <clears throat> on the biofilter? So we haven't done specific um, recirculation trials, but we have, uh, we've identified it as an area of, of study and, and something that we plan to focus on next year. Um, I think we have very high digestibility in shrimp, you know, 90% um, on the protein side and low phosphorus levels. And so when you start talking about maintaining your biofilter, uh, really eliminating all of your residual nutrients in the water column is, is the name of the game. And, and so we're, we're hopeful that we can make a difference there too. Okay. Yeah, from your perspective, you have slightly different uh, feed feed requirements, don't you, for your, your recirculation systems? Um, I think in general, if you're running a clear water rust system, I don't see a lot of impact, uh, you know, potential impacts on feed kind sedative on the water quality. Uh, but in comparison, if you're running, you know, a bioflock system that sort of uses single cell protein, you know, single cell organisms to convert waste into microbial protein, um, yeah, and you get that immunostimulant or better effect. Uh, it might not be so repeatable in a bioflock system. So I would, you know, sort of suggest that if you could switch to a product that is more reliable in terms of uh, delivering that immunostimulant, would be probably more stable. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, another sustainability question here. Um, it's an interesting one. Uh, for, a, for a truly sustainable aquafeed ingredient. Does it make sense to burn natural gas during production? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so we use natural gas, we use a fossil fuel, we don't burn it. Actually, the microbes that we grow um, consume it in the same way that you know you breathe oxygen, they breathe in uh, methane. Um, and, and yes, we, we recognize we have a greenhouse gas impact and we have a plan to transition away from that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't really share much beyond that, except that we are, um, we are focused on having a long run plan to being, you know, greenhouse gas neutral and, uh, you know, eventually even hopefully greenhouse gas negative. Right. I look forward to finding out more about that uh, as and when you're allowed to divulge some details. Um, there's a quite a few questions about the inclusion rate. Um, Alan, and maybe yeah, and I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, we tried in the paper five to 15%, um, and there was a dose response. Uh, I, I think that in general, the kind of five to 10% range is where we found the best kind of cost benefit trade off um, from a least cost formulation perspective and also a, a benefit perspective. But if you have specific questions, I will um, you know, ask that you leave an email in the chat, you reach out to me afterwards, I can put you in touch with our technical directors in the region. Um, so Jaren in Thailand, Wang Jia in, uh, in China, and we can work with you on, on what your exact question is. Very good. Um, a lot of people are asking when they can get hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next year, um, if, if somebody needs to trial it from samples, uh, we can do that, you know, ASAP, but, uh, from commercial production, I, I'd be happy to talk to you about, uh, when you can get it next year and kind of what quantities you're interested in. Fantastic. Um, there's a few questions here, uh, about EMS, um, Locke, I'll refer this one to you. Um, how can you tell when there has been a, an EMS outbreak, um, and how should you react? 
Yeah, you know, actually, in the past, uh, we were very uh, reactive when it comes to dealing with EMS. We just, you know, we seek for a, a curative approach. Uh, but now I think farmers are much uh, better informed and educated. So they understand uh, how to uh, uh, farm um, no matter EMS come or not. Okay. And, uh, but however, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, preventive methods already that include better biosecurity, water management, feed management, and so on. Uh, but uh, if it's so unfortunate that you found is an early EMS outbreak at some particular ponds in your farms, the first thing you need to do is to reduce feeding or stop feeding, uh, plus the waste, doing more water exchange. And after um, a certain period of time of off feeding, could be one or two days, uh, you can start putting some prophylaxis uh, in the feed uh, to, how to say, just like, cleaning up the, uh, the screen gut. And then uh, you may supplement more probiotic to reestablish a better um, microflora in the screen gut. And uh, you know, with uh, basically with those methods, uh, I would say that the success rate is about 80%. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, how quickly you can uh, diagnose the pond and you can react uh, uh, fast enough and you are well prepared. You know, when we talk about, let's say, off feeding, water exchange, sometimes farmers is not uh, prepared for that. They don't have water reserved for water exchange, for example. Okay. And are, are there any telltale signs without doing um, uh, diagnostics? Uh, you know, basically, uh, we may need to send samples to laboratory for uh, specialists to make uh, correct diagnostic. But uh, now you can find a lot of uh, photos on the internet showing uh, how a cross eye uh, infected animal look like. And you can do your own um, cross examination. I would say that uh, the accuracy could be like 90% already. Okay. And, and uh, just uh, look at another question from the audience here. Would you use probiotics alongside a functional feed? Um, it, it, would you use a multi-tiered multi approach? Uh, I don't see any problem when we are using uh, two both. Yeah. So it's a common practice. You know, for example, let's say the probiotics, um, when it ferments certain ingredients, it may also produce some secondary metabolites, bring down the pH, et cetera. And it's kind of similar uh, to uh, functional ingredients that we we're talking about. So I don't see any uh, conflict when we use uh, those two in combined. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that's just about all we have time for. So I'm just going to ask uh, one last question to, to each of our panelists. Um, Dr. Oropind, um, this one's for you. Uh, I just wondered what your plans were to follow up uh, on your research. Are you up? If we can, uh, if you could unmute, please, Doctor Arvind. Okay, for this product, for for the feed kind, or, feed, feed, yes, or either, in general, uh, either feed kind or, or or in general, it depends if you have plans to do more feed kind research. Oh, okay. So I think during this time, because of the the raw material cost increase a lot, not only the soybean meal, but including all the protein material, yeah. So we have, for my opinion, yeah, the research that that we done, or uh, we plan to to do, uh, I think I think we we find some raw material that can replace on the high price material, yeah, like the like material to replace for fish meal or the material that cheaper than the protein source that cheaper than soybean meal to reduce the cost of the feed because of the cost is really important and key point of success or benefit for the farmer. The second, during, during culture, the, the animal, yeah, we face a lot of uh, the disease problem. So the group of immune stimulant or the group of immune booster is really important to, 
to supplement in the feed. Some raw material, uh, because of it have the high efficiency, we cannot supplement it every day or at the high doses. So top up at farm may be the good choice uh, for for do for do this. Uh, the feed management also the it, another part that really important and some material that they contain high protein and also have the some metabolite or some active ingredient that can promote the immunity. It will be benefit for the farmer to top up at farm in case of the farmer they face the problem of low feed intake yeah, or they face the problem of some disease outbreak and they need to reduce a little uh, feed given to the shrimp. So the high protein material, including uh, the immune booster, yeah, really, I think it's very important to to give as interval. Yeah, I, I think this is the scope of the research. Buy some uh, raw material to reduce the feed cost. Uh, use some feed additive, yeah, to promote the utilization of the feed, like the enzyme or the mineral, yeah, and also. Uh, the feeding techniques or feeding management yeah, to use the, the material or the ingredient uh, effectively in case of they have both nutrient and also have the immune stimulant property. Yeah. We, we will do on this support. Thank you very much. Well, um, yes, we wish you all the best with your, with your next project. I hope it has, a, 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 has interesting results and it's, it's very reassuring to know that um, so much applied research is going on uh, in, in universities in Thailand at the moment. So thank you, Dr. Arapind. Um, Locke, from your perspective, um, what are the key takeaways um, of Dr. Arapind's um, findings? You asking me? Yes, please. Yeah. So I very much agree with what she already conveyed. Um, and I think with uh, better science, better research, now we understand that stream farming is not like gamble. Yeah, we can make the production system a lot more predictable. We can make the fee perform in much uh, predictably. And uh, we can make the crop a lot more predictable. So we don't have to be in a position that uh, we're dealing with uh, something uncertain. So I think that's the key thing for us to scale up the, the shrimp production globally. Okay. And yet, uh, from your perspective, uh, reducing uncertainty sounds like it might be qu quite nice for you. Yep. So, you know, you know, Henry Ford once said, if he asked everybody what they wanted, they would have said, I wanted a faster horse, right? So a lot about product development is really understanding what your consumers might need, even though they do not know it already. I see this product as one of them, uh, being able to mask itself as a protein replacement, but does the job of, you know, giving that EMS uh, protection. So the, the question really comes down to whether, how low can Kalista get the cost down to for fish meal replacement? And if that's the case, they can get it down with scale, with adoption, you know, riding the cost curve, then I do see a potential real big game changer in terms of uh, improving the whole industry as a whole in terms of predictability, performance ROI. And once you know your farmers makes money, everybody makes money. Brilliant. Well, that sounds like a, uh, so easy, Alan, so easy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Yen. I, I, I appreciate that. And I think, if, you know, if COVID has, has shown us one thing, it's, it's kind of the vulnerability some of us sit at these long supply chains. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the reasons we all are excited to go to work within Callista is because it does, there is this opportunity to um, have local production, reduce food insecurity, improve the supply, the sustainability and the reliability of the, the feed supply chain. Um, it's something that, you know, we get excited about. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank you for, on behalf of the fish site and on behalf of Callista um, and thank our panelists uh, and thank all our audience. Um, this will be, recording will be available shortly. Um, and so we hope you will pass on the findings to, to your friends and fellow farmers. Yeah, thank you everyone. Cheers everyone, goodbye.